you are able and willing this morning, would you stand please and join me in our call to worship. In the midst of waiting, God sends us hope. We await the birth of the child of peace. For with the gift of peace, we see the world as our God dreams. And we are dared to dream as well. That, that the child will come, and we shall be changed to the, to the glory of God. Amen. God of the darkened light, God of the morning light, come to us again. Come to us in the breaking of bread, and in the voices raised in song. Come in the silent moments, and amidst the joy of fellowship. Come in our faithful evening hopeful watching. Come to us in the cry for peace and with the hope of forgiveness. Come be with us as we celebrate and give praise. Amen. The first hymn for the service this morning is number 116 in the Black Animals. O come, O come, Emmanuel. We'll sing the first two and the last verse, number seven. One, two, and seven. Number 116. Savior, who will come to redeem us and offer us forgiveness. 
we have already been given that gift. We are empowered to, to do all kinds of amazing things in the name of our Savior. Go forth, be free, and know the love of God, to whom be all the glory. Amen. As a sign of those many gifts, would you reach out to your neighbors and extend a greeting to Christ?
in the days of old and is in former years. The New Testament is from Philippians. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The gospel appointed for this morning is in the third chapter attributed to St. Luke, the first six verses. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler in the region of the Tyrrhenia and Turconius and Lysanias ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his pathways straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the gospel and the promise of our coming Savior, Jesus Christ. The words are true and they can be believed. Amen. In the Black Hymnals, it's number 12. I sing the mighty power of God. Would you sing with me from your seats? I sing the mighty power of God that 
made the Naaman's rise that spreads the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at God's command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of our God that filled the earth with food. God formed the creatures with a word and then pronounced them good. Oh, how your wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. On earth there's not a plant or flower but makes your glory known. The clouds arise and spread their showers by order from your throne. All life is but a gift from you and ever in your care. Wherever people gather you, oh God, are present there. If I may, I'd like to focus a little bit on that passage that, that Marcia just read from Philippians in the sense that there is a conversation being had around the people on whom God's blessings will flow. God loves all. God loves and blesses all. We live in a time and in an era where if we are not in complete and lockstep accord, we seem to find reason to create enemies and strangers out of friends and neighbors. In this passage, Paul is writing to a community where people were suspicious and uneasy with one another. They were at odds with one another over things that mattered very little in the grand scope of things, and yet they were tussling with how it was they were to be the church, how it was they were to be followers of Christ Jesus. We can disagree on a myriad number of subjects. It doesn't matter whether it's over a book being good or well-written or not, whether a film is worth watching or not. We can disagree or agree on any number of things, but it seems to me in the season we are now living in in the church, this season of preparation, that the most important thing that we can do is find the areas that we have in common. What is it that we hold true? And what is it that matters about what we hold on to, whether it's true or whether someone else's view is not true? How is it that we as the people of God can find common ground? What do we see and what do we know that is for us a rock-solid foundation? And how do we look at others for whom that may not be the case? Let's boil it down. The oldest hymn of the church, probably known to us, is that notion that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, in this day and age, that word may be disagreeable. There will be those who will say you can't use the non-inclusive language around the divine. But essentially, the church has always been willing to admit that Jesus Christ is Lord, period. And if we will start there, where we agree, maybe we can find other areas in which or on which we also agree. As Marcia was reading, I was struck by the idea that the gifts that God gives are for all who will confess, not to some. Not to only the ones who confess as I do, 
or in the way that I do, or in the form that I do, but to all. I'm not the one who is the arbiter of who is worthy of the gifts of God. And yet, the contentiousness that we surround ourselves with as the people of God in the body civic, in Bears versus Packers, there's always somebody else who is wrong. And in the season, the run-up to Christmas, is it possible to back away from asserting that others are wrong and I am right? Is it possible to step away from that worry about you've done this wrong, you can't do it right, you can't have it that way? Maybe we can just go back to Jesus Christ is Lord and start there again and again, and maybe that's the basis on which we go back to over and over and over again. People will worship in different ways. As you know, I grew up Catholic. There's a routine in the way in which our Catholic friends engage in worship. There are things that are Pavlovian bells in my head. If I hear certain things, I know exactly what I'm supposed to say. I know exactly what my body is supposed to do, stand, sit, or kneel, even still. We don't do that in the Reformed Church. We don't have those same kinds of things. Our Orthodox friends do things even more differently than we might imagine in some cases. When they baptize a baby, for example, the child is baptized naked without a gown. It's ultimately covered, but the child is taken to the font naked, and after the child has been given the gift of the grace of baptism with the water, they then take a long salver and they jam communion, wine and bread, in the baby's mouth. You ever seen it done? It, well, if you've ever fed a baby, you know it ain't an easy thing. And since Orthodox priests don't have children of their own, it's even more fun to watch because they're jamming it in their throat like you're giving a kid medicine. Now, I've, I've done one baptism by immersion in the course of my ministry of, a, of an adult believer. That ain't the fount on the wall. And I'm not terribly fond of cold water streams either. But that's what it called for. That's what the circumstance asked for. And that's what we did. It's different. <clears throat> Brother Yoakum, did you have a baptistry in any of the churches you served? In, like the full bathtub baptistry? Charlie, did you have a bap bathtub for baptisms in your, any of your... Your son-in-law does. Okay. The curtain there would, would have a garage door opener attached to it. And I have a colleague who preaches in Centralia, Illinois, in a Disciples of Christ congregation. And there is, we call it the baptismotron. You open the curtain with a garage door opener and the heavens open. And behind there is a ceramic bathtub. And Paul is not very tall. It's built for a man's scale. So it's kind of like watching a Muppet over the altar when she does a baptism and they step down into it and it's about three and a half feet deep. Now that's not how I do it. That's not how I want to do it, frankly. But that's the community in which she's serving, and that's what you do when you do a baptism. And some of you may have even lived through that, seen it, liked it, want it to be the way we do. I get that. That's fine. I'm perfectly willing to do it if that's what we need to do. But it ain't part of my experience, folks. I'm really good at the little sprinkle thing that they find so boring. That's not a baptism. You're just sprinkling on the baby you got to get them in the water. That being said, is one method right and one method wrong? Is it central to what we are as to whether you dip, dunk, or sprinkle? It begins to sound like an hors d'oeuvre treat. Does it ultimately matter? Some people through the years have said absolutely it matters, and schisms have broken out in the church over the centuries over doing baptism right, and whether it's done when they're an infant or whether it's done as when they're a believer. Ultimately, I come back to what's the affirmation of the church? Jesus Christ is Lord. 
And is it possible that even when we disagree over the methodology, that we can send our voices together in that refrain, Jesus Christ is Lord? Because ultimately that's what matters to a people of faith. Do you believe in something or do you believe in the accoutrement, if you will, of how we do our faith? Is the building more important than the work of the Lord? Is the appearance of the things that we use to decorate at Advent more important than reaching out and feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and sheltering the homeless? Does one matter more than the other? Or is it simply a matter of Jesus Christ is Lord? And if Jesus Christ is Lord is the centering perspective, then how is it that we will address the question of what the world craves and needs? And how do we look at the ways of living and share what we know is true? I may choose one method, you may choose another. But Jesus Christ is Lord. And all who will dare to believe, all who will dare to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord are within the keeping of God. And no one who in this earthly sense is in control or power of the buildings and the communities and the congregations has the authority or the right to say someone has got it wrong if they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't get to choose what you believe about Jesus Christ is Lord. If you will affirm it, I dare to think that you believe it, and therefore you are within the keeping of God's sight. For too many generations, we were busy deciding who had it right, who had it wrong, who belongs, who does not, who should be in and who should be out. And especially in Advent, the question is not who is in and who is out, it is that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's it. End of statement. Except that's not how people work. We keep scorecards, we consider behaviors that we do or don't like, voices that sound like ours, words that are used like ours, and the ones who are in our tribe, the ones who are ours. And the ones who are not ours, we push aside, we ignore, and we forget. But what we do when those people whom we have pushed aside knock on our door and say, Jesus Christ is Lord? It's the secret password, if you will. Old frat boy speaking here. If you know the right words, you don't get the right to turn somebody away. What's the password of the church? Jesus Christ is Lord. That's enough. It doesn't matter beyond that. If people will confess that truth, they belong. They may choose to do things that we would not. They may respond in ways that we do not. But if they will say, Jesus Christ is Lord, they belong. Now, let's come to the communion table. Who belongs here? There are traditions that say you can only be one of us by the way we write the rules. You can only come to this table if you look at it and understand it in the ways that we do because you condemn your very soul if you take it not the right way. And we have lots of people who act as gatekeepers around this table because others are unworthy according to our considerations. If someone will come to this table, known to me or not, who has on their hearts that phrase, Jesus Christ is Lord, why are they not worthy of this table? And why would we turn anyone away from the table of the Lord? Even those who don't know the phrase, don't know the words, don't understand the theological implications of that gift, who come to us hungering for something more, have the privilege of coming to this table, not because I am the host, the pastor of this feast, 
but because Jesus Christ is Lord and is the host and who extends the welcome. In a time when we put up barriers, great and small, significant and insignificant, impossible to surmount and easy to break down, the simple refrain, Jesus Christ is Lord, reigns at this table. And all who will confess, all who have confessed, all who come to confess that simple phrase, are welcome not only at this feast, but in the household of God. And for the household and the people of, the, of God to, to look around and see that there are strangers in our midst and there are people who are hungering for the truth that we know, how can we best welcome them? Than by sharing with them the bread and cup that is central to our faith. Because Jesus Christ is Lord. To whom be all the glory. Amen. Are there joys and concerns that ought to be remembered in the life of the church this day? Uh, I would remind you that um, that Jerry Wilcox's funeral will be next Saturday morning here in the church at 1030. Um, And there will be a luncheon following after the family and I go out to the cemetery, but uh, that'll be over at 841. So if you would like to be here, you are certainly welcome to be here. Uh, for the 1030 service on Saturday. Other concerns or joys for the day? I'm not sure if it's a concern or a joy. The Packers have their bye week today. I see a couple of hands coming over this way. Here comes Don. Here comes the mic. Uh, Don. It's a joy to have Wally and Kim in church with us today. <laughs> Wally, did she tell you what I told you about, told her about feeding you? She used to treat you like a 16-year-old boy, which means Doritos, ice cream, other items that she would other be aghast at giving you because you are to eat like a 16-year-old boy. You've had one of those in your home. I know how much John could have eaten at that point. And I presume you have it within you to eat. (laughs) I I hear there was a malt machine being employed not long ago. Well, good. Good to see you. Good to see you feeling better. Keep, Keep eating like I've ever had that problem. Charles, here comes the mic. Thank you. Uh, I hope you won't take offense at at this, but uh, someday I'd like to... Uh, hear what you have to say to us ab- about how can we reconcile uh, the differences between our two political parties. Well, yeah, that was kind of what I did with some friends last night. <clears throat> so we had. I gathered with some college chums, and we always have a political food fight whenever we're together, because that's what we do, because we've done it since we were 18 years old. I will, I will file that under to, the, to be considered and, 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 and wondered about file. Thank you, Charles. Other concerns or Joyce? Joyce. If you can talk about the Packers, I can say the Warhawks won Saturday, and we should be home again this Saturday, and if we win this Saturday, we'll go to the national championship. There you go. Will that be a better bowl than the Packers, or the uh, Badgers get? Okay. Um, something just went in and out of my head. Oh, well, it'll come up later. What do you know? Would you pray with me, please? Merciful and everlasting God, we gather in humility before you, remembering that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're grateful that in the season of Advent, we have the chance yet again to be reminded of the ways in which we have things in common the lives that we live, the communities in which we live, the work that we do. We have far more in common with each other than that which divides us. Help us to overcome voices and images that would seek to divide us and disparage others with whom we disagree. 
and to hold fast to the love that Christ brings in the form of a child. We praise you and we bless you for the gifts of healing and wholeness that offer us lives renewed and restored. We're grateful for procedures that have concluded and for the healing that is ongoing. It's December. Things are crazy across the street. The young folks of the university are coming to the end of the semester. They are coming into finals. They are coming into projects that end. And they look forward to the Christmas break. Give the instructors and the faculty who work with them the patience to endure these next several days. And give all of them a, a, a position of gratitude for the life of the university. It makes an impact in this city for which we are grateful. And we thank you that it continues to grow and flourish. We ask that you would continue to give it and us the chance to interact and be faithful and good servants and stewards in this city. That we would together continue to make a difference. We pray for our friends at Fairhaven in a time of a challenge and change. We're hopeful and we're grateful for the work that the caregivers offer those who are resident there. And we think of those who are of our family and of our friends who are resident there. Keep them healthy and well in this coming winter. Help them to know that they are in our thoughts and bless the hands of those who act as healers in that place. For they have done so very well for these last six decades and more. And we pray that their mutual ministry will continue to flourish, for it is certainly needed and necessary. We pray for those who are away from their families at this time of the year, mindful of the rhythms and ebbs and flows. We are thinking of them who are away and thinking of those whose places at the table feel emptier than usual. Help all of us to remember that your love and your grace goes between us even when we cannot be together in times such as these. We pray for the Universal Church, for the United Church of Christ, for the churches of the Wisconsin Conference and our friend Franz, who is our conference minister. We pray that his ministry would continue to be fruitful and faithful in our midst. We pray for the churches here in Whitewater of whatever stripe or tradition. We pray that our ministries in common would help in advancing the words that Jesus Christ is Lord are a part of who we are and be welcoming to those who confess them, welcoming to those who hear them, and welcoming to those who may not speak them themselves. Bless the searches that are happening in those places and welcome to new ministers who have joined the Collegium. Again, we pray, let us be faithful to our call for this, the Congregational United Church of Christ, we offer you our thanks and blessings. We're mindful of the voices of beloved friends and family who once helped fill this room with sound and song, who are now part of your heavenly realms. They are remembered here, and they are missed here. And we are grateful for the time which we have shared with them, brief though it may once have been. We look forward to rejoining those voices in our own time and day. Finally, using words that our Savior Jesus has taught us, we lift our voices together and offer our family prayer to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those of you who are a part of the regular worshiping community, we are grateful for the pledge cards that you have already turned in and the promises and the commitments you have made uh, for the financial support of the ministries of the church. I have to confess, I have been very pleased and very overwhelmed by your collective generosity already expressed in those cards. Um, you responded in spades and we're grateful. Uh, as each Sunday unfolds, we have the opportunity to share gifts 
that advance the ministries of this church, and we're grateful for your continued sharing. For those of you in the room, you can use the plates at the back of the room. For those of you watching on screen, you can forward gifts to the church at the Congregational United Church of Christ, 133 South Franklin Street, Whitewater, Wisconsin, 53190. And we will be grateful for your collective support of the ministries of this church. In that spirit, then, would you stand, please, and join me in the singing of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Creator Christ and Holy Ghost. Amen. Join me please in the prayer of dedication. We lay these gifts upon your table, compassionate God, in hopes that they can be used to fulfill your intentions in this world and in this church. Bless us who have brought them, and bless all who will receive them, that they will show forth compassion and hope, love and commitment, joy and peace in places far and near. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We continue with the communion insert, beloved in Christ. The gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus Christ was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, and on that same day sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and gather about Christ's table. You may be seated. This table is for all who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's own people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God on high. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel, and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in the faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and with all people everywhere, and that you remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We come in celebration and remembrance of the, good new, of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Jesus lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die for us, to be raised from death on the third day, and then to live with you in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church which you have gathered, with your faithful in every generation, in every place and time. We join our voices to praise you with joy. Holy, 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 God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, Hosanna in the highest. We remember anew these acts of Jesus on the night of desertion and betrayal. He took bread, and after giving thanks to you, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. In like manner, after the meal, Jesus took the cup, and again, after giving thanks to you, gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, drink. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it, and remember me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
Eternal God, we unite in this covenant of faith, recalling Christ's suffering and death, rejoicing in his resurrection, and awaiting Christ's return in victory. We spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives committed to your service in behalf of all people. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine and on us. Strengthen your holy church that it might be the champion of peace and justice in all the world. Restore the earth with your heavenly grace, which is able to make all things new. Be present with us as we share this meal and throughout our lives, that we may know you as the Holy One, who with Christ and the Holy Spirit reigns forever. Amen. The bread which we break is the body of Christ. The cup which we share is a sign of the new life which Christ brings. The gifts of God for the people of God come for all things are now ready. Take and eat, take and drink, and know the gifts of the Lord. Continuing with the prayer after communion, let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love and that your holy church might be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. The final hymn for this morning from a standing position will be number 120, There's a Voice in the Wilderness Crying. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, a call from the ways untrod. Prepare in the desert a highway, a highway for our God. The valley shall be exalted, the lofty hills brought low. Make straight all the crooked places where Emmanuel may go. O Zion, who offers good tidings to the height of the mountains, dare lift your voice to the cities of Judah. Behold, your God declare. Like the flowers of the fields we perish, our human works decay. The power and pomp of nations to give the weary rest. But the word of our God is forever. Our defender's will is strong. God stands in the midst of the nations to render right the wrong. Then God shall, as a shepherd, the lambs gathered to God's breast, and pastures of peace shall greet them to give to the weary rest. 
Go forth from this place knowing that the grace and mercy of God, our Father and Creator, the fellowship and companionship of Jesus Christ, our coming Lord and Savior, and the communion of God's Holy Spirit goes between us and among us all until we gather again in Christ's name. Amen and amen, and there's coffee. Authorize that and yeah. just signed off on yeah. the payroll. Yes, we're